great pleased to have um, Dr. Richard Wally here, and he's talking about a very um, popular subject about, you know, the symbol of Maine, right, our lobster. And he's talking a bit about the habitat, the ecosystem, and how we can sustain uh, the lobster industry. So Dr. Wally is with the Darling Marine Center in the University of Maine, and he has graciously agreed to be here with us this afternoon, and thank you so much, and we will turn it over to him. Thanks very much to all the, the MPIBL staff here. I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, what an amazing setting that you have here. I'm just really uh, shocked we can even project uh, a, a slide in this, in this amount of light. So um, uh, really, it, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I, uh, I worked at Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences for 15 years, and we had a similar science, kind of science cafe and uh, I just thought they were great opportunities to start a conversation about science. Uh, it's always nice to have a little glass of wine and some cheese to sort of lubricate the conversation, right? So um, I hope you'll, you'll um, you know, have lots of questions. And, uh, but I, I wanted to start out by just uh, throwing the ball in your court just to get an idea of uh, what walks of life you're from and where you're from geographically. So. Um, Let's start off with the locals. Do we have any lobstermen here? Oh, all right. Okay. There we go. Okay. Well, you're here to keep me honest. Okay. Okay. Keep me um, and uh, what about just uh, um, you know, year-round residents uh, here? Okay. Great. A good segment. With summer residents. Okay, and um, from uh, New England, uh, uh, that are not that are not uh, full timers. Yeah, from New England. What about outside New England? Arizona. Okay, anybody? Can anybody beat Arizona for distance? Georgia. Georgia. Okay, well that's pretty far too. Uh, any further? Any other countries? Uh, Canada. Um, Europe. Okay, so we're mostly in the Arizona takes in. Okay, and Georgia's a close second. Good. Well, I, I'm going to quiz you here, um, and and uh, the lobstermen can't answer this question. Okay. Um, you know, I'm I'm sure you all know how how iconic the American lobster is to, to Maine and to the region. And, you know, I was just looking up some statistics on, on the lobster here. I mean, I've been working on lobsters for, God, I'm, I, it's, I'm afraid to admit it, but about 30 years. I started working on, on lobsters for 30 years. I've gone into different uh, other arenas of marine biology, but um, Lobsters have always been sort of my mainstay, and you'll, you'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But I was looking up some um, statistics, uh, you know, about um, the, the industry and so forth, and I just want uh, somebody to to feel the guess at how valuable, in terms of the landed value that um, collectively uh, fishermen bring in in dollars, U.S. dollars, to the state of Maine. Anybody have a just lobsters? Just just lobsters. Just lobsters. Okay, what, what was that worth in dollars? Three hundred fifty million. Any other guesses? There. Four four sixty. I went four sixty. Taking higher bets here. Billion. Four hundred hundred. Fifty-seven million dollars was the landed value. Just four hundred fifty-seven million dollars. So four sixty was pretty good. Now, now you know that's just the landed value of the lobster. You've got multipliers on that because there are all sorts of businesses that depend on this fishery. We got boat builders and trap makers and uh, you know various other things, rope makers, restaurants, exactly, and. 
you know, the, the, the folks, the economists who do this factor <coughs> roughly guesstimate that it doubles the, the value of the industry. And that's not even counting tourism. Okay, so tourism is adds significantly on top of that. So that's about, you know, in round figures, about a billion dollar fishery, right? And uh, I was just looking it up today. The, uh, the 2014 GDP, the gross domestic product of the state of Maine, in round figures, is $50 billion. So this, this industry, just the landed value and its multipliers, accounts for about 2% of that. This one product accounts for 2% of that, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the economy's, the Maine's economy, Maine's GDP. Um, so what I'd like to uh, go into today is um, to just impress upon you how, at this particular junction in time, how perilously dependent uh, the state of Maine is on this one fishery right now. And um, we are at unprecedented highs with respect to this, uh, the volume and value of this fishery. It's never been as, as abundant or as, uh, as valuable. Um, but the big question is, how long will that last? Uh, so um, let's launch into this. I've, I've got about you know 12 slides here. I'd really like to encourage conversation here. So I'll go through these 12 slides. If you have questions, certainly you know, pipe up and ask. But most of this, uh, after the slides go through, I'd just like to open to, to discussion. So um, that's my hope, is to sort of set the stage for a discussion. With these Hasn't slides. it been at this height for several years? Hasn't this volume of, of lobster been in there for several years now? Well, you'll you'll see a time series that shows just how exponentially the, the fishery's grown in the past decade or so. So I'll, I will get to that. Well, one of the first things I want to impress upon you is this this perilous dependency because it hasn't always been like this. Um, if you look back at the the harvests of of, uh, of our fisheries in Maine um, over the past sixty or so years, uh, we are we were once a fishery that was dominated by ground fish. Hands down, it was, uh, when I say ground fish, I'm talking about, of course, cod and haddock and uh, uh, various kinds of halibut, halibut exactly, uh, herring, uh, a number of different, number of different fisheries. And these, uh, these ground fish have been uh, depleted over time and uh, ever since about the late 1980s, the abundance of lobsters has started growing and growing and growing. Uh, so we're really at a, a point now where, uh, where our coastal economy is perilously dependent on this single, very valuable fishery. And there's some who think that, um, and one of the prevalent hypotheses out there is that that uh, it is the very demise of these ground fish that has uh, has promoted the expansion of the lobster population. Uh, in, an, in essence, it's sort of the story of the incredible shrinking fish. Not only have they been depleted in abundance, but all the big ones have been harvested out of the population. So now we're left with a lot of little fish that just don't function as predators as they used to used to be able to get these big 100-pound cod. You look back at the old historic records. That's a, a thing in the, of the past in most places now. Um, <clears throat> so we've depleted many of these, predi these predators. Are you getting feedback on that? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to. Sorry, I think it's your speaker in the back. Oh, yeah? Yeah, 
cod would eat the larva of the lobster? The, the cod would uh, eat mostly the, the little babies that settle to the seabed. So essentially, now we've got uh, you know small cod and other ground fish that um, so, to the point where you know lobsters are outgrowing their the predators really quickly. Yeah. Can you tell me what we're looking at there? I don't know what those uh, are. Okay, so <laughs> this is this is a picture. It's a little it's a little uh, it's the consequence of being a little bright out here. But what we're looking at is a um, net full of ground fish. These are um, these are haddock and uh, cod and some flatfish in there. Um, but just an example, an underwater picture of a net harvesting, harvesting fish. Um, so there's certainly um, ground fish depletion that's been going on. The other thing, the other factor here is climate change. And uh, we have, in the Gulf of Maine, we've been seeing clearly uh, you know, an increase in temperature over the past uh, uh, several decades. But that's especially true over the past 10, 15 years. So whereas uh, since 1982, on average, the, uh, the increase has been on the order of one degree at a rate of one degree every 40 years, uh, since 2004, that's ramped up to a, a, an increase of one degree every four years, about a tenfold increase in temperature. Now that may be, uh, uh, you know, you can select different uh, time frames in here and calculate different rates. The point of the argument is that uh, that temperatures have been uh, increasing at a faster rate in recent years, much faster than than uh, in the past. Yeah, question back the there. The warming localized or the Labrador current of warming of the, the, the surrounding areas warming as well, or is it because of the depth of the water? Or what, what's the What's the uh, idea of that? I'm, I'm sorry, the feedback's a little getting to What's contributing to the change since 2004? The, the areas around warming as well, Labrador cars? Right, well, so we are getting a lot of warming uh, associated with just insulation, with, with the, uh, the um, uh, warming due to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, sun impinging on the uh, on the um, seawaters, and um, you know, as a result of uh, the accumulating um, CO2 in the environment, uh, we're getting increasing uh, increasing um, increasing warming. So uh, so there's a combination of that and the fact that there's been less circulation in the. Uh, the, the rate at which uh, the deep waters have mixed down or mixed up into the to the surface has uh, slowed down a bit. Got a question here? Is that in general all around? Well, the Maine North the Atlantic, Maine? the North Atlantic in particular, has been warming at a more rapid rate than um, than the rest of the globe. And uh, in 2012 was the the uh, warmest year on record for the western North Atlantic. Uh, so, and, and, and the Gulf of Maine was right in this, the epicenter of that, that the eastern seaboard from, from the mid-Atlantic up to the Gulf of St. Lawrence uh, was warming at, these, at this really high rate. So 2012 was uh, on the order of two to three degrees Celsius uh, above the average for that entire year, and it, and it broke all the records. It really was an ocean heat wave. Um, the other thing that we're seeing with, with climate change, of course, is, is ocean acidification. And the North Atlantic also is uh, uh, acidifying at a rate higher than uh, much, of the rest of, uh, much of the rest of the world. So the warmer colors you see here, the deeper reds mean lower pH, lower pH means greater acidity, and uh, so we're seeing in the North Atlantic again uh, at this greater rate of uh, acidification. Now, um, the thing about acidification is that it's really this, this uh, 
brother of, of climate change. We've got two things happening, warming temperatures and acidification. We're starting to understand a lot about the impact of warming temperatures, and I'll show you some images of that. But our understanding, we're lagging way behind in our understanding of the impact of, uh, of, uh, of uh, acidification. But one thing we do know is that the North Atlantic is acidifying faster than most other parts of the globe. Um, our, oh, the impact of acidification on uh, marine organisms is still poorly studied, although there's a lot of money going into that question. And the interaction is even between uh, acidification and warming temperatures is even less well studied. Um, but one of the things we do know about its impact on, on organisms is that it's very life stage and species specific. <laughs> so you can't make generalities about the impact of, of uh, uh, acidification uh, based on a study of only the larvae or only the adults or only lobsters versus a fish or a clam or an oyster. Uh, so we need these very uh, uh, targeted studies that address not only our commercial species but our, our ecologically important species. Yeah. So quite, I see that from you going from the 1700s to now and, and so what's the source of data for the 1700s? Right, well, so <clears throat> based on uh, understandings of, uh, understanding of, um, of uh, historic air temperature records and, and uh, sea temperature records, going way back to the 1700s, they can start to use models to interpolate what's going on around the west of, rest of the world. So these are very much estimates and probably better used as relative measures than absolute measures. So good, good point there. But if you want to look, uh, if you want to dig into the source, the source here is the Global Ocean Data Analysis Project, and you can you can get online and and, uh, and look more deeply into that. Yeah, and good. why is it acidifying? It, it, it's acidifying because of uh, the increasing levels of uh, carbon dioxide in the environment. So. Um, these are the tool, the dual effects of, of global uh, CO2 uh, uh, levels, both the, the warming effect, the greenhouse effect that we see, as well as the acidification effect. Another question. Do the, um, the runoffs of uh, fertilizers and so forth have any effect on the acidification? So this is, this is another important effect, especially in estuaries and coastal waters. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, what's called eutrophication or, or added nutrients from farms and uh, wastewater from our, our domestic um, our, our domestic water usage. And that adds nutrients to our coastal waters. What that then triggers is uh, algal blooms, uh, phytoplankton blooms, greater productivity in the system, but then that productivity dies. That decay process produces more CO2, acidifies the, the waters, and so you get these more local coastal acidification effects. And that's why it's so important to abate uh, the, the uh, nutrient inflow into, into our estuaries. So uh, not only do we have this global effect of, um, that, that results from our burning uh, fossil fuels, but then we have these coastal effects and local effects of those that result in so, um, oops. so all this taken together uh, ultimately influences the distribution of lobsters. Let me see if I can get this going here. Now, this is, I'll repeat this, I can loop this again, but what you're looking at here is an animation that uh, reflects the changing distribution of lobsters in, in our coastal waters from the mid-Atlantic up to uh, the coast of Maine and off Nova Scotia. Is it, is it based uh, on catch data? Or? And it's based on, on trawl survey data, federal trawl survey data that's uh, collected by uh, bottom sampling nets called otter trawls. The, fed, the feds go out, National Marine Fisheries Service goes out, 
and samples of breeder sites twice a year up and down uh, the coast, um, right, in, right in against the coast. And then the states pick up in state waters and sample in clubs. I don't have the state counterpart to this, but this gives you a, a let me just run it again so that you can. Uh, so you can see that the center of distribution, going back to the uh, late 1960s, 70s, was initially down in southern New England. You see these hot spots in, in Massachusetts, Cape Cod Bay area. And it was around the 1990s where things really started moving uh, to the north and east, so that by uh, you know, the late 1990s, we had the center of distribution right off our backyard here, off of uh, off Mount Desert and uh, and southern Nova Scotia. So right now, we're we're looking at some of the most productive lobster habitat on the planet, right out our backyard here. Do you have a temperature there? overlay on this one? I'm sorry. Do you have a temperature mm -hmm. overlay on this one? Uh, I like don't have friends. a temperature overlay on this, but I can, uh, that's the next slide I'm coming to here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the cue. Uh, so the consequence of that shifting distribution is that Maine has just gone through the roof with respect to harvest. I think this gets to the um, gentleman back there, his question, where we, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even early 90s, we were looking at about 10,000 metric tons harvested per year, very stable over that period. And then in the 1990s, late 80s, early 90s, it started taking off. And even over the past decade, it's just gone through the route. Uh, whereas in southern New England, uh, we're looking at uh, a very different pattern. There was an initial in Massachusetts and Rhode Island to two southern New England data sets here. Uh, the harvest started to ramp up in the um, early 1980s. And around the 1990s, they started to really fall off, and especially so in Rhode Island. And you can just see how southern New England's landings now, put on the same scale, just pale in comparison to, to Maine's. So we're looking at, again, uh, historically unprecedented Landings here. Yeah. Good question. Is part of this um, increase a reflection of the other fisheries declining and fishermen changing what they're, you know, would go after? So there's exactly. a natural there's a natural shift to more people getting into the lobster and that yeah. getting the lobsters. Well, so that that's a very good question. Um, but these are these patterns are also reflected in those fishery. Okay. independent of all surveys that, that I just uh, uh, showed in that, in that previous animation. So, and we're also seeing this in Nova Scotia where they've been you know, more or less controlling the fishing effort uh, much more than they, than they are here. Uh, question yeah, over here. Uh, it's great. Another reason why Maine is doing so well with, with uh, lobstering is that there are different laws regarding, you know, what you can harvest and what you have to throw back. Well, yeah, so let me get to that. Certainly, certainly um, uh, all the protective measures that we're, uh, we've put in place, many of them, many of which have been initiated by the industry, things like protecting the, the females, putting V-notches in the females so to protect them. Uh, that means, for those of you don't, who don't know what a V-notch is, that, that means a uh, you know, fisherman brings up an egg-bearing female, so notice it's egg bearing, that means he can't harvest it, but he puts a little notch in the, the tail fin, a little flipper, and that marks her as a breeder. And then if she's harvested again, even if she doesn't have uh, eggs on her, she's protected. So that's the V-notch program. Then we have the oversized, uh, we protect the oversized lobsters, because you know a big lobster's worth much more in terms of egg production than, than the little lobsters. So there are certainly those protective measures in place. But uh, from the perspective of the ecological interactions that are going on, we think they're playing a very important role in uh, explaining the dramatic difference we're seeing between Maine and Rhode Island uh, and, and southern New England. 
And that, in part, has to do with the fact that, well, I, I mentioned the depletion of the ground fish. That, that had to play, in, uh, likely played an important part. But also, we're on a, a very interesting boundary with respect to temperature in, in uh, the Gulf of Maine. This is one of the uh, steepest north-south gradients in, in uh, sea temperature we see on the planet. I mean, it's really a steep temperature gradient. Up, up around uh, the Bay of Fundy, temperatures, I'm sure if any of you have been swimming out here, um, <laughs> you know that the temperatures don't get much above 50, maybe 55 degrees, the highest, um, right off, right off the coast here, and as you work, work your way east. Whereas you go down to Rhode Island, you're bathing in this nice, you know, 70 degree plus water. Well, uh, we are crossing the lobster comfort zone here with respect to temperature. And lobsters historically have been sort of, especially for the young ones, the larvae, are sort of on the cold side. And now things have been starting to get warmer here and more favorable. We think that has a lot to do with the, the increase in, in, uh, temper, in abundance here in the, uh, in the eastern part of Maine, which we've only started to see, uh, which is really driving the, the big surge here. If you, if you break this out by county in Maine, you'd see that from about Penobscot Bay to the east, really is what's driving this pattern. Uh, as you look further to the south and west, those counties, while increasing some, haven't anywhere near increased as much as, um, as, uh, as the eastern counties. So we think um, we're starting to get into more favorable temperatures for lobsters, and we've also got you know, things uh, uh, getting better in terms of having been better in terms of predator, the risk of being eaten by predators. On the other hand, in, in southern uh, New England, uh, we're on the hot side of the comfort zone for lobsters. So uh, you don't have to get too much above about 72, 73 degrees uh, Fahrenheit before things get very uncomfortable for lobster. And we're seeing that in, um, in Rhode Island, Long Island Sound, Buzzards Bay, to the point where we've seen mass mortality events in, in Long Island Sound back in 1999 as a result of a, a major warming event. We're seeing the nurseries in uh, the coastal areas receding because those shallows just get too hot for, for lobsters. They're moving into deeper waters. So <clears throat> where, where it's cooler. Question here. Is the pH the same all over? Or are uh, different? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, it's not entirely uh, uniform. Um, and in fact, the coastal areas are, are more acidic. Um, and uh, as you move out into the open waters, they, they're less so. And that, again, is part of that uh, cycle of productivity, phytoplankton productivity, and decay that makes the, the coastal waters more, um, more acidic. And now when we've got the global effect of further acidifying the seawaters, we're seeing um, an overall uh, downward trend in, in the pH or, or level of acidity. Um, but you know, the, the role of changing uh, acidification is still very debatable um, in terms of its impact on the abundance of lobsters here. I saw a question back here somewhere. You, I think you answered it partly. Their, their shell is chitosan, which is not going to be sensitive to pH. Mm. But it may be as a, the younger lobsters may have a pH sensitivity. I'm not sure. Right. Well, and so uh, they, they do deposit calcium carbonate in the in the um, in the shell. So um, that would be, uh, you know, the concern is that like mollusks, other shell-bearing organisms that depend on calcium carbonate, that increasing the acidity of the water will um, make it biologically harder to lay down, uh, lay down a, a, a calcium carbonate skeleton. So, um, so 
Yeah, it's a very, uh, the skeleton's a very complex, make, complex matrix of, of uh, carbohydrates, proteins, and then this mineralized uh, 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 fraction. Um, uh, yeah, another question. Yes, yeah, so other, other than um, our state's conservation, too big, too small, and very yeah. Yeah. females, are the takes larger? Because are, don't we, aren't we limited to a certain number of licenses? So they, the takes must be, they must have more in their traps. This is how it works. They, they have a, a, a limited number of traps they can harvest, that use. Per, uh, per lobster, per, per a limited number of licenses. And then there's a lim what's called a limited entry program that really is a, sort of a, a valve that, that uh, just allows a certain number of harvesters to enter the, the industry. Um, and there are, uh, it, so it's a lottery system that essentially lets, lets uh, some, a small percentage in every, every but year. But does that stay? Fishermen so probably you know, have a better stay, sense of this. Somewhat sort of stable in the thousands, so, so many Yeah, so Maine, Maine has roughly 6,000 licenses uh, in the entire state. Um, but, uh, you know, an interesting aspect of that is we have an aging fishing fleet because um, uh, you know, we're, we just aren't having enough uh, uh, enough young guys enter the fishery to, to bring that age structure down. Yeah. Do we know if the number of lobster traps out there is on an increase or decrease during this time period? We well, the number the number of traps certainly has increased, and um, but there are these limits on um, on, on number of traps per fisherman. 800 traps. Some the mains divided into zones A through G, and and uh, some of the zones have lowered their limit even further to 600 traps. So um, so there is some local uh, management, and but that uh, you know early on in this new management, I'm talking new management going back to the like, mid 90s, um, there was an influx of new fishermen into the, the fishery that really inflated uh, the, the effort. And so, you know, it's one of these things where you squeeze the tube in one place and start oozing out in the other. You got one more question? Oh, yeah. oh the question, sorry. I'm, I'm just a local fisherman now. Okay, just, good. All I have is some anecdotal. <laughs> yeah, great, let's hear it. And before limited entry from Northeast Harbor, and so I fish out of Southwest Harbor. Yeah. And we had, I go out in the morning with all the fishermen, so. Yeah. Before limited entry, I went out with 17 fishermen from Northeast and Southwest. We have over 50 going out through now. Yeah. So that, and that's great because everybody's making a living. The last yeah. few years were my best years. Right. I've had a license right. since right. 1962. Right. But, so there are a lot more traps. Yeah. Way, but there's a lot more losses than everybody. Yeah. Right. right. I right. think everybody's pretty happy. Now. Yeah. But I, I would just comment that we love our V notch law and we love yeah. our oversized law. Absolutely. Work. But I was just came back to Cape Breton last weekend and they don't have any v notch law, they don't have any oversized law. That catches double last year. Well, and, and the water temperature was 34 degrees. Now. Still very cold. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so environmental yeah. <laughs> right, right. <clears throat> and we're seeing that Southern Gulf of St. Lawrence is a place that's really expanding now. Um, and, and the outer Cape Breton. But if I could just continue. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you mentioned the large predators, but uh, some of the older guys have seen. You know, the large predators have been gone for 35 yeah, 40 years. Yeah. But what was it like? Even in this harbor, this used to be a great sardine slot. Yeah. The, fish, the herring used to come ashore in great numbers. They yeah. don't do that. Yeah. They went, our opinion is that when lobsters are in the larval state, the herring will feed the shore on the larval state. Yeah. Well, they mix into the coca Yeah. And that gets into the pH, because I don't think the pH just affects calcification. I think it has to do with the reproductive rate of plankton. We don't have the plankton. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So that I mean, it's really a major factor. Yeah. Well, so <coughs> what we're hearing is that there are a lot of different opinions here about uh, and uh, about uh, what's driving the system. And uh, but the bottom line is, uh, you know, you're not going to have a, a, a viable fishery if you don't protect it. And, and you know, kudos to the to the industry. Um, who've really taken the initiative to um, put these protective uh, measures in place on the air. Um, yeah. Does bluegrass, the depletion of the old grass, have any effect on the 
lobster population? You know, I'm going to get to uh, uh, some words about the lobster nursery habitats. And um, we know that, that eelgrass is important for a number of different fishes, but um, it doesn't seem to be as important for lobsters, at least in that, you know, those earliest life stages. So, um, so let me say a few words here about, about the, uh, the nursery habitat work I've been doing. Um, and, you know, it all is sort of couched in the, in the, um, in the desire and hope that we can use these different monitoring programs that uh, we have in place uh, to forecast or have an early warning system for trends in the populations. And so um, going back to the, uh, well, late 1980s when I first got started in this game uh, with lobsters, um, <clears throat> we started looking for lobster nursery habitats. We looked in eelgrass beds, we looked in um, kelp beds, we looked in rocky places and cobble beds and so forth. It turned out the highest concentrations of, of the tiniest lobsters, the right on the tip of the finger, um, we found in pretty shallow cobble beds. Um, right out here, you know, off Northeast Harbor, uh, to the south and the west, were some of the some, um, great nursery habitat. Um, and so uh, the hard thing was, was to try to figure out a way to, to quantify them. Um, and, and so we developed this diver-based technique that involves this, this tube you can think of it as an underwater vacuum cleaner that's driven off of a, scu a separate scuba tank. And it's got a little mesh bag in the top that captures anything that's, that's um, caught in, in, the, in between the rocks. So you have one diver moving the, the rocks out of the way and the other one going in under the rocks and getting up in, the, in all the nooks and crannies. And uh, so we started doing this and we really started to get some numbers. So and then we initiate, initiated a, a monitoring program down off of Booth Bay at a few sites and started to see we got some very predictable signals there. Um, and I'll show you the spread of our coverage now. But um, fast forward to just about seven or eight years ago, one of the drawbacks, of course, of this method is that you're only limited to about you know, 40, 50 feet in terms of the effective working depth of, of, of divers. And uh, so we developed this, this passive collector, we call it. It's, uh, it's just trap wire uh, made into a, a, a tray that's about six inches deep and uh, is lined with a fine mesh. And it's filled with their favorite, the lobster's favorite habitat, the cobble. And mm -hmm. they settle in through the grid and it uh, turns out it's a very good sampling tool. So, um, and it's roughly the same area here, sample. So we, we put out lots of these in different places, and then we get a picture uh, of the uh, of uh, lobster abundance. So here's here's the sampling coverage we've we've got now um, using these two methods. The the red is the the diver based suction sampling. The yellow is the uh, the collector based sampling, and. Um, uh, the Canadians have really gone to town with the collectors, um, and uh, we've used collectors in more of an exploratory mode, especially to get out into deeper waters, um, and on some of the banks like George's and Platt's Bank here, um, and started to uh, started to reveal some of the patterns that we see uh, along the coast. So it turned out, out of all this effort in Newfoundland, we got one little baby lobster. Um, <laughs> um, although we saw other juvenile lobsters, but we got one young of year. And, uh, uh, but otherwise, you know, we're, we're seeing very interesting patterns along the coast. And so in places where we have pretty long time series, I'm just focusing on the suction sampling time series here uh, that go as far back as 1989. Um, we have places like uh, Midcoast, Maine, where it goes uh, as far back as 1989 here. And you can see we get some ups and downs here. Um, we started sampling outer Penobscot Bay uh, and uh, you know started to see this big hump here. 
Um, that was very consistent with what we saw in Mount Desert uh, and Jonesport, Maine, and even over the border in Beaver Harbor, New Brunswick, where they, they started way back in uh, 1990. Um, and so we start to see these consistent patterns down along the coast. You uh, start to get further south, though, south of Cape Cod, and uh, we see that um, things have been on a pretty uh, precipitous downward trend, especially in the past um, uh, uh, 10, 15 years. And this is, uh, you know, reflecting the, in part the, the impacts of, of uh, these warming temperatures. Well, of course, we want to use this, these ups and downs. We want to see if they're useful as a forecasting tool. Can we use these little young a year babies as uh, an early warning system for uh, the landings we might see six or seven years down the line. That's about how long it takes a little baby lobster on the tip of your finger to mature to uh, enter the fishery. And so, um, uh, so I'll just give you an example of uh, three areas where we have the longest time series that are also oceanographically contrasted with them from very cold summer temperatures to sort of intermediate summer temperatures to very warm summer temperatures. So let's first just look at their landings trajectories. Okay, and this is the reported landings or harvests from these different places. We've got uh, mid-coast Maine that's been sort of hovering uh, in, in the middle. Um, Eastern Maine, it's just been going through the roof. And then uh, Rhode Island, which has been down, going down and down and down. Um, but they all started roughly, uh, roughly at about the same level. Um, this is those same reported landing. But the question is, uh, what, um, uh, what are we going to be seeing in another five, six, eight years? Um, and this is where our forecasting model comes in. Um, these are the projected landings moving, moving forward. Uh, and the pine cast ones, the ones that we, we should have already experienced. And you, you can see here, model's not perfect, but it's <coughs> at least capturing the uh, three trends that uh, we actually see in the landings. So based on our sampling of the babies, using that diver-based approach, counting them every year at the end of their larval settlement period, uh, we use these uh, mathematical models to project how many uh, should oh, the overall trends in the, the population as to whether they should be going up or down. Um, so we're heartened that these uh, forecasting tools are going to be useful. And um, we're just in the middle of sort of the proof of concept tests of, of uh, applying them to other regions. And I just wanted to back uh, up to um, just wanted to back up to uh, let's see. Yeah, I guess I don't show it here, but um, I, I'll just add here that um, somebody mentioned Cape Breton here. We're seeing. Uh, this whole area of southern, the southern Gulf of St. Lawrence, just going through a real explosion now, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how that translates to the fishery. Yeah, <laughs> question. I, I know you've been waiting. How reliable are your mathematical models plus or minus? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. We're we're putting error bars on them just as we speak. So um, so let me just show you. Um, but. Yeah, we, we've got error bars here. This is an older version, a simpler version, but they're roughly uh, you know, like this. So there's certainly some overlap here amongst them, but we're, we're capturing the major trends. But this is a major area in which we're um, you know, starting to, to work is to develop the confidence intervals, as we call it, around these, around these uh, estimates or, or projections. Yeah. Are you saying the Canadian lobstering will it increase at the expense of the 
main luxury? Well, I don't know. I was not going to say it's at the expense of, but um, I, I think what the overall trend that we've seen, you know, I don't have the, I'm not showing the, uh, the uh, Canadian trends here because our, our time series were relatively short in this particular case, but um, we've gone from a, uh, you know, the, the high, in the southernmost location, the highest value, the highest settlement rates, if you will, were, were in the uh, early 90s. As you get a little further north to, say, Pasco Bay, Maine, um, it was in the early 2000s that you see that, that uh, similar pattern going right up the coast. Uh, well, these are Cape Cod Bay, Boston Harbor, Beverly, May, Beverly Mass, York, um, and then we have uh, Mount Desert, Maine, uh, Jonesport. This peak is a little bit offset from, from that one, off, off to the right. Beaver Harbor, New Brunswick, which is here. And then, well, only a short one here, Lobster Bay, uh, uh, Nova Scotia. But we've seen a, sort of a, a wave of abundance pass through the system. And now the most recent one to see that wave is up here. So um, uh, are we confident this is going to be a really useful forecasting tool? Well, it's showing some positive signs. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say it's, it's going to work in every area, but uh, it's, it's starting to um, bear some fruit. Yeah. yeah, you said lobsters like the habitat where there's cobble. What exactly is cobble? So we, we sample habitat where there's cobble. What is cobble? Cobble is a uh, uh, rocky uh, habitat that's, um, you know, let me, let me put it this way. It's, it's rocks that are uh, between the size of a, a grapefruit and a, a cantaloupe melon. Okay? <laughs> Somewhere in that size range. And that seems to be the ideal habitat. I got Just you. a question. What's causing the precipitous fall off? Yeah, well, this is a this is an important question. I mean, we've got um, whoop, we've got uh, here we're at a time of, of uh, you know, peak abundance of, of breeders. You'd think we'd have uh, just um, unparalleled uh, larval settlement, <clears throat> and uh, it just speaks to the fact that just because you have breeders and an abundance of egg production, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to have uh, high levels of, of larval settlement. The, the factor we're not accounting for is that um, you have weather and climate um, carrying larvae offshore. Just to fill you in a little more on the life, the, the uh, larval stages, they, um, they uh, hatch off the egg-bearing female. Uh, they go through three larval stages and then a metamorphosis to the post-larval stage. That whole process takes about four to six weeks depending on where you are. The warmer places it's shorter. And so they're at the mercy of the currents uh, during that time. They're floating, drifting in the water, especially that last larval stage right near the surface subject to wind, especially subject to wind-driven currents. So if you get currents uh, and weather systems that are unfavorable to transport inshore, then they'll get transported away from shore and away from uh, these, these important nurseries. So you may have all the egg production and larval production in the world, but if you get those unfavorable winds, a lot of that gets exported from the system. So that's, and that's where we're, a big piece of what we're trying to understand is how that oceanography interacts with the biology. I'm just wondering if the, the current has increased because of the north of the north, and I know that's affecting the herring population, so that right. affects the other lobster. Uh, yeah, so, it, and you've got things happening at different time and, and spatial scales. So that's, that phenomenon of the, um, uh, melting of the ice caps, the enhanced um, uh, flow of the uh, Labrador current uh, is a pretty large scale process. Um, the earth turned off. 
that a Sorry? The urchin population? I know when I came here, there were urchins everywhere. Yeah. And then the commercial urchins. Right. Well, and that's all. Boy, don't get me started on urchins. That's a whole other, that's a whole other story um, that has a lot more to do with har harvesting impacts on urchins than anything else. But um, we can we can get to that in a minute. But um, just sticking on the topic of, of lobster larval transport, uh, we know that, for example, there's a very strong uh, current along the eastern main coast called the Eastern Maine Coastal Current. That's uh, that coming from the Bay of Fundy. It's part of a gyre that goes in a, in a counterclockwise uh, 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 direction, and uh, that cold water carries uh, carries uh, egg, eggs or, or larvae from upstream. And in fact, I have a I have a slide here. Um, oops. gets to the larval transport. And um, there are a couple of uh, groups working on, on uh, models, circulation models, that, um, that uh, have been applied to the entire geographic range of the species. And let me just talk you through what's going on here. It'll, it'll loop through continuously. Um, the red is the if, if we had a uniform coverage of lobsters, so first of all, just assume we have a uniform coverage of lobsters over these shallow waters. The red is the, the first larval stage. Remember I said there are three larval stages, and then a fourth post-larval stage that's the, the stage that settles to the seabed. So those are the, the first stages. Uh, the next color, I believe, was green, and that uh, that's the second stage. Blue is the third stage, and black is the fourth stage. And uh, focus on our territory here. See how? Um, let's start again. See how um, uh, larvae are being carried along the coast here by this very fast-moving current. It's cold and fast, and what it does uh, <coughs> is it. Uh, unless larvae get the chance to go into a little embayment, it tends to dump any larval production upstream down off the, right off the mid coast of Maine here. And in fact, this particular nucleus here, right off Penobscot Bay, is some of the, the most productive uh, lobster habitat we have and the you know, highest population densities that we find in the nursery in the nursery grounds. But anything that gets carried away from shore into uh, deep, very cold water just isn't going to survive. Uh, and so, uh, so you're very much subject to the vagaries of year-to-year -year, uh, uh, weather, uh, the direction of prevailing winds. That's driven by uh, where the jet stream is positioned uh, at our latitude. Sometimes the jet stream is a little further north and you get more uh, southwesterly prevailing. Sometimes it's more directly westerly. And that can make a, have, a, have a large effect on, on where, larvae, um, where larvae end up. But, um, but this is sort of the state of the art in terms of circulation modeling. Now we've got to apply a, a mortality rate that we just don't have a handle on. Question here. So you Oops. just mentioned about that breeding ground in, I'm assuming it's an upper Comstock Bay, up around Searsport? Uh, actually, not. Most of the breeders are, are stay on the outer coast. One thing um, oh. egg-bearing lobsters don't like is low salinity. So as nice and warm as it might get up that far into Penobscot Bay, um, lower salinities um, are bad for larvae. And the mothers tend to know that and physiologically. So, and so you're looking so at like stay, Stonington, 
Yeah. So, yeah, 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 so a lot of the egg production is happening here, and there's also a lot, of, so here we're in the Canadian side here, and there's a lot in Thompson uh, Bay area, a lot of larval settlement here. Grand Manan is another location that has um, these uh, uh, big populations of breeders, um, and so you can think of this as sort of a larval superhighway. You know, the, the, um, the, the larvae are hatched off and then they, then they get uh, 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 infected or transported down, down the coast to uh, where, I, where I live. And you get lots of settlement uh, right down the coast. What about the mercury pollution that's in Knox got bread? Yeah, well, um, mercury, of course, is, um, is uh, toxic and it, you know, it's a major, major health issue for um, human consumption. So that area where they've detected uh, uh, mercury in the sediments uh, has been, I'm not sure if it still is, closed off to, uh, to lobstering. And, um, and so that's more of a human health issue. Um, I'm not sure those levels of mercury are necessarily toxic to the, to the, uh, to the lobster. I think those tests still need to be, to be done, but this is more about you know, trying to avoid human consumption of those lobsters that are living on those sediments. Have you guys still worked on that whole you know, I've, I've, uh, I haven't been directly involved with it, but I've, uh, I've been um, interviewed by some lawyers who are working on it, <laughs> and, uh, and I've sent some literature their way. I, uh, it was back in the, oh, around 2003-04, we did some studies uh, of uh, a sediment disposal that um, that uh, uh, Army Corps of Engineers was doing in Penobscot Bay. And they, it turned out they were doing disposal at what you'd think would be a, a smarter time. It was strongly influenced by the, the, the fishermen. They were doing it at the time at, in, in December, January, late November, um, when lobsters, at least the commercial lobsters, were moving out of Penobscot Bay. Um, and so we didn't see much impact, just in terms of the numbers of lobsters around that disposal area. What we did see was crabs just moved in them, and just uh, we saw this huge concentration of crabs around around it. So the two species respond very differently to these uh, to, to the uh, disposal event. Yeah. Just, just another little local. Yeah. Uh, they, when they dredged Bass Harbor, they dumped up in Blue Hill Bay. And my nephew fishes up there, and that that turned out to be the best fishing ground for the next oh. two years. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, gotta, you gotta imagine there's all these worms and stuff yeah. in the yeah, in the it center. Worms. It's gotta be really wild up there. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, okay. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.